The myth of Prester John. Love to the sister Darlene Ray, who is uh, giving me great drop, giving me great drop. So much of uh, this is just going on, man. This drop nation. Digging in the crates. Thanks to everybody. You know what I'm saying? Surfing the wave and love to everybody out there. Love to Jay Stu. Love to the family. Um, you know, it just feels so good to build with my brothers and my sisters, man, and just to create something out of what we thought was just, you know, you know, sometimes you think it's separate until it gets real and then you realize there is no separation. The separation the whole time was an illusion. And now we have to work together. We have to build together. So love to everybody, man. Part five. Let's go. The myth of Prester John. Priest John. All right. I mean, some people think he's a hijack. Some people think he's been hijacked. Remember with the brother getting to the root of it all, dropped on us. About this Prester John, did a black man discover the fountain of youth? Is he a hijack? Is he an Israelite king? Fighting against the Christians? Fighting against the Muslims? Did he get hijacked by Chan? Cham? Did Genghis Khan hijack him? We know another name of his is Ong Kong. Ong Khan. But Khan is a title. Hey, it's alright, man. Don't be confused. We're just going to keep going and you know, slowly it's going to start to unfold, man, for everybody. So, you know, this is very interesting as well. Genghis Khan's foster father, Ong Kong, asked Prester John in Le Leve de Merveilles. Some kind of French, huh? 15th century. Genghis Khan, foster father, Ong Khan. As Preston John. You remember how we signed off on this joint. It says below we camp at Tool River. Where the ghost of Tug Roll. On Preston John Khan still treads. So his full name according to this researcher is. On Khan. Tug Roll on. Preston John Khan. This con is just a title. Is he a hijack? Has he been hijacked? I'm like 50-50. I mean, sometimes I'm like, yo, I think this is an Israelite king that they've been hiding from us, man. I think there's a lot of drop when we unfold this thing. And he's right here. Right here in America. Then I'm like, damn, well, I don't know. Maybe he's, maybe he's the king of the hijacks, man. I don't even know, man. We got to get to the bottom of this thing. I'm on your ass, Preston John. We on your ass, Mr. John. Come on. Let's get to this right quick. The myth of Preston John. The following is from chapter 30 of the travels of Sir John Mandiv Mandiv Mandeville. Sir John Mandeville. And presents a series of fables about the East. These fables must have made popular reading. Since the myth of Prester John was commonplace by the time of the Age of Discovery, a list of resources follows the text. So this was a commonplace myth that had a foundational legend by the time of the Age of Discovery. The Emperor Prester John, Hong Kong, <laughs> holds full great land and hath many noble cities and good towns in his realm, and many great diverse owls and large islands, owls and large. For all, so he had all these large islands and noble cities and good towns. This guy, this priest, this priest king. For all of the country of Ind. I-N-D, end, uh -huh, is devised in owls or islands for the great floods that come from paradise. 
that depart all the land in many parts, and also in the sea he hath full many isles, and the best city in the isle of Pentexur is Nice or Nisi, that is a full royal city and a noble and full rich, so it's full of riches. This Prester John hath under him many kings and many isles and many diverse folk of diverse conditions. Whoa, I mean, why haven't you heard of Priest John? He has all these kings under him, these isles, these islands are all under him. And many diverse folk and diverse conditions. And this land is full, good, and rich, America. But not so rich as in the land of the great Chan. Ah. So now we're having a little competition of riches between Chan and Prester John. Between Chan and Prester John. And remember, remember, remember the time. Remember Genghis Khan. All right, Genghis Khan. Zingis Khan, this is Cham, foster father of Hong Kong. So if Priest John was his foster father, that means that he took in this mongrel or Mongolian or whatever Cham, Cham is. And so I guess this Zingis Cham and this theory, I'm just throwing out a theory. I'll just throw it like, say it like this, did Genghis Khan. Inherit his Khan title based on the fact that he was brought into this family of these princes, Khan, prince, these lords, whatever you want to call them. So was he brought into a noble family? He was a foster son, right? So Genghis Khan's foster father, Hong Kong, is Prester John. So Prester John, according to this, okay, you, you have it, you got the link. You look it up. So Prester John is Genghis Khan's foster pops. And he took in Genghis Khan. And Genghis Khan inherited his title. Or more correctly, he overthrew his foster dad and took his title. He took it. He took this, this title over here. And now we suddenly have this Magnus Cham, this Gang is kind of Tartaria, this takeover situation. I mean, you know, surf the wave. I mean, was he hijacked by his foster son? Let's keep going. Because I don't know. I really don't know. So he had all these people underneath him. He says, this land is full and rich, but not as rich as the land of Chan. Tartaria. For the merchants come. Not thither so commonly for to buy merchandise as they do in the land of the great Chan. For it is too far to travel to, and on the other part, in the Isle of Cathay, men find all matter thing that is need need to man. Alright, so they're saying in the Isle of Cathay, that's that Tartaria. Alright, Barbaria, clothes of gold, silk, spicy, spicery, and manner avoid. However you say that, Avor du Poor, Avor du Poor. And therefore, albeit that men have greater cheap, have greater cheap in the Isle of Prester John, than less men dread the long way and the great perils in the sea in those parts. So they dread the long way. For in many places of the sea be great rocks of stones of the adamant, that of his proper nature draw with iron to him, and therefore there pass no ships that have either bonds or nails of iron within them. And if there do anon the rocks of the adamants draw them to draw them to them, that that never they may go thence. I myself have seen afar in that sea, as though it had been a great isle full of trees and busco buscale full of thorns and briars and great plenty. And the shipmen told us that all that was of ships that were drawn thither by the adamants, by 
for the iron that was in them and of the rottenness and other thing that was within the ships grew such buscael, buscael, and thorns and briars and green grass and such manner of thing. And of all the masks and cell yards, it seems a great wood or a grove, and such rocks be in many places uh, thereabout. And therefore dare not the merchants pass there, but if they know well the passengers, or else that they have good loads. Good loads men. So, in other words, you need to drop the flying press of John. That's all they try to say. You need to have the drop to find press to John. If you don't have the drop on the sea, you don't want to navigate to get to this press to John. Also, they dread the long way. So, of course, it's a long way. And therefore, they go to Cathay. Cathay. For it is more nigh. Alright? And again, when you look up this Cathay on the map... map of cafe what do you see for cafe <laughs> just want to get a nice clear image here yeah, these look like they're kind of small let's see this one what do you see for cafe what do they call a cafe man Oh, they ain't gonna let me see that one. See, they being janky with the photos, man. Being a little janky with the photos, huh? Ah. Mm hmm. I see something of end. We just read that I N D end. <laughs> Alright, I want to get even closer, you know what I'm saying, clearer view, but this appears to be the same setup as over here. Alright, this is Tartaria, they call it a cafe, they even call it something with end. I want to get an even bigger one than that. I know we're knocking on the door. Let's see what else we got here. Mm hmm See, more and more as we start digging up, we're going to start really getting into this, this Hindu, this Indo-Aryan, this, you know, all that connection to the land of what we're calling Africa today and all the Hindu connection to the Americas, the Chan, Cham connection, the Indo-Aryan, the Atlantean connection, if you know what I mean. Yeah, man, I get into maps. All right, so anyway. We just want to look at a little cafe situation. So we find a little drop on it, but they don't give us too much. But, you know, we see pretty much where we're oriented. You can see, you know, a little bit on this one that we are talking about so-called Africa. All right. So, um, when we are digging up. So they dread a long way and therefore they go to Cathay. You know that they're still talking about that Abyssinia, Abyssinia, Africa situation, Tartaria situation. Because it's closer, it is more nigh. And yet it is not so nigh, but that men must be traveling by sea and land. 11 months or 12 from Genoa or from Venice or he come to Cathay. And yet is the land of Prester John more far by many dreadful journeys. So from that point <laughs> in that cafe in this Africa 
It is many journeys. Many's of journeys. To find Pastor John. Dreadful journeys. And the merchants pass by the kingdom of Persia. And go to a city that is clipped. Hermes. For Hermes the philosopher founded it. And after that they pass an arm of the sea. And they go to another city that is clept or called Golba. And there they find merchants. And of Papenjays. Papenjays. As great plenty as men find here of geese. And if they will pass further they go uh, sickerly enough. They may go sickerly enough. In that country is but little wheat or barley, and therefore they eat rice and honey and milk and cheese and fruit. The emperor Prester John taketh always to his wife, the daughter of the great Chan. Uh, the emperor Prester John taketh always to his wife, the daughters of the great Chan. And the great Chan also in the same wise the daughters of Prester John. For these two be the great lords under the firmament. <laughs> I, can't, I can't make this shit up, man. I didn't mean to get on the flat drop, but yeah, firmament. I can't make this up. But really, even more impressive than that, is that these guys are marrying their daughters back and forth. This great Chan. Right, are we still talking Genghis Khan? Is, is Genghis Khan? And Preston John marrying their daughters and wives back and forth. The Emperor Preston John taketh always to wife the daughters, the daughter of the great Chan, and the great Chan also. In the same way, the daughter pressed a job. All right. For these two be the great lords under the firmament. Right. Is there a firmament on your spinning ball? Or are they kind of giving you some drop right here? In the land of Presta John be many device, diverse things and many precious stones, so great and so large, that men make them vessels as platters, dishes, and cups. And many other marvels be there, that it were too cumbrous and too long to put it in scripture of books, but of the principal owls, and of his estate, and of his law, his law, I shall tell you some part. So Preston John had a law. What's the drop? The emperor Preston John is Christian. Okay. Is he Christian? Is he Christian? I mean, we heard that before from the jump. Then we started tearing back them layers. You know, the interesting thing is that when we go back to, let's see, even here, the, uh, the European legend of Preston John told of a Christian patriarch. So there was different legends of Preston John. The, the European legend gets this Christian thing going. But all legends don't go into this Christian situation. I wanted to find this one place. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to find it now. It just popped in my head where it said Preston John was uh, fighting Muslims. And then he started fighting. Or he had some beef with the Muslims and then beef with the Christians.
Yeah, we're going to get into this because, you know, then you get into the Nestorian Christian. And remember, we looked up Nestor. Old King, renowned for wise counsel. Old King, renowned for wise counsel. So any followers of Nestorius is a form of Nestor, Patriarch of Constantinople, Nestor. Alright, so then, you know, that's what got us thinking that is this a Christian hijack. Then we got deep into our Lost Tribes and Promised Lands, and we got into... <laughs> The Christian fanaticism against the Jew came together with loathing from the ways of black captives that began rolling off from these Portuguese ships that had gone searching for Prester John in the first place. The ancient image of the noble Ethiopian was leaving its trace upon the memory, but for a moment at least, it is Petronius and worse who becomes our authors once again. So you keep hearing of this Prester John through this Christian hijack. So also was his Jewish ancestry invisible, buried deep in legend. So his Jewish ancestry or Israelite ancestry was buried deep in legend. Prester John was a symbol of racial and religious toleration within Christianity's complex heritage. So this doesn't say he was a Christian, but he was, you know what I'm saying, a symbol of religious toleration within it. So what was the toleration? What was the limits? You know what I'm saying? What, what was Preston John working out? What was his angle? But ultimately he would be, not be able to withstand the assault of the new outburst of prejudice directed against both eastern and southern components of his identity. Even in the simpler Hellenistic form, the noble Ethiopian had proved unable to withstand the challenge of a demonic black image coming up from further south. So much the more vulnerable then, the more vulnerable then, would the complex figure of Prester John B. in the era of Christian fanaticism against the Jew came together with a loathing for the waves of black captives that began rolling off from the very Portuguese ships that had gone searching for Preston John in the first place. I know that's a mouthful. But I'm letting you know that there's this, you know, demonic black image that was, he's running, you know, from being, you know, this, this new image, this image, this demonic black image, this nobility. Now it's the renaissance, right? It's the rebirth. You can't have a, you know, black noble image anymore. So now it's labeled demonic. All right, we're going to get back here. You know, I'm just making a good little intro. You know, going through some of this great drop, man, that the sister Darlene Ray sent over. You know, you know, let me get a little bit more of it if you don't mind. So this is the Emperor Preston John as a Christian. But we know he's... <laughs> It's, it's, it's getting complicated, Preston John, but we on your ass. And a great part of his country also, yet, but yet, they have not all the articles of our faith as we have. Okay, so he's a Christian, but he's a different type of Christian than us. So what do they label him a Christian for? He says, they believe well in the Father, the Son, and in the Holy Ghost, okay? According to their perspective. And they be full, devout, and right, true, one to another. And they not set, uh, set not by no beret, uh, berets, something, uh, catals, nor of no deceits. And he hath under him 72 provinces, and every province is a king. And these kings, so he has 72 kings. And these 72 kings have kings under them, and all be tributaries to Prester John. And he hath in his lordships many great marvels, for in his country 
is the sea that men call or clap call the gravella sea gravelli sea that is all gravel and sand <laughs> So now we got this gravel and sand sea. Remember how we broke it down before and the sister Darling Ray even sent some backup. The Sabat Yan Sea. Sabat Yan. Also Sabat Yan or Sabat Yan. Sabat Yan. Sabat Yan. So Sabat, Sambat, Sandbot. A legendary river across which part? Of the ten tribes were exiled by exiled by the Assyrian king. Shalman Assar is this Shalman Assar in the real timeline? Is it does it really link up to this Genghis Khan and Cham situation? Is that the Assyrian king, the king, this Abyss Abyssinia situation? Abyssinia, Abyssinia. So this river, legendary river across which part of the ten tribes were uh, exiled by the Assyrian king. So they were exiled across from this legendary river. So this legendary river Across which part of the ten tribes were exiled by the Assyrian king. I am trying to make sure I got it right. Shalmanazar. And which rested on the Sabbath. The river is mentioned in the Targum. Pseudo Jonathan. Uh, this is X. Or maybe that's Exodus 3410. I would take them from there. And place them on the other side of the Sabbath River. The rabbis declared that. The ten tribes were exiled three times, once beyond the Sambanyan River, once to Daphne of Antioch, and once when a divine cloud descended upon them and covered them. The first description of miraculous quantities or qualities to this river is found in the Tammuz, when the teeniest Rufus asked our Akiva how he could prove that the Sabbath was divinely ordained on the day of rest, he replied, let the river Sabatyan prove it. It was unnavigable on weekdays because it flowed with strong currents, carried along stones with tremendous force, but it rested on the Sabbath. These passages give no indication as to the supposed location of the river or the origin of its name. The only inference that can be drawn from them is that it was located in Media. The Medes, the Medes, Persia Medes, Iranistan, is that what they're saying? I mean, are they saying Iranistan or are they saying Iranistan? Zimbabwe, is this what we're talking about over South America? Prester John is here. They're saying that the river is here with Prester John. And instead of Iran being over there in Vindia, Cham, is it somewhere over South America? You know, just a thought. Let's go. So that's the river being mentioned again. Let's get that part back. Now they're calling it the Gravelli Sea, which is the same thing. It says, for in this country is the sea that men call or clip the Gravelli Sea that is all gravel and sand without any drop of water, and it ebbeth and floweth in great waves, as other seas do, and it is never still and in peace in no manner season, and no man may pass that sea by navy, uh, uh, by no manner of craft and therefore may no man know what land is beyond that sea and albeit that it have no water yet men find themselves on the banks full gush fish good fish and other manner 
of kind and shape that men find in any other sea that they ought that they be of right good taste and delicious to man's meat. So even though we haven't read yet that this particular sea stops on the Sabbath, we know that it has no water. It's a sea of sand. You know what I'm saying? Um, sand and rock. And it has all this tremendous force. And it even has good fish. <laughs> and a three and a three journeys long from the sea be great mountains. Out of which go without a great flood that cometh out of paradise. So now we're talking about Eden and paradise and Meru or Peru or the center. Everything, all the drop that they found and wanted to come get from over here. And it is full of precious stones without any drop of water. Right, and runneth through the desert on that one side so that it maketh the sea gravelly. And it beareth into that sea and there it endeth. And that phloem runneth also three days in the week, and bringeth with him great stones, and the rocks also were therewith, and that great plenty, and Anon, and Anon, as they be entered into the Grav Gravelli Sea, that that be seen no more, but lost forevermore. Amen. So we have all these different kind of confirmations of this sea. We've got the Emperor Presser John. When he goes into battle against any other lord, he has no banners born before him. But he had three crosses of gold, fine, great, and high, full of precious stones. And every, and every of those crosses be set in a chariot, full, richly arrayed. And for to keep every cross be ordained ten thousand men of arms or more than one thousand one hundred thousand men of foot. Alright, so you know now they're tying them with this, you know, back to the cross. They're putting them back on the cross. It says the remembrance of Jesus Christ suffered upon the cross. That's why he has these decorated crosses. Man, was Preston John a hijack? What was he doing here? Was he hijacking us? Was he <laughs> was he a devout Israelite? Was he in bed with this Chan situation or was he fighting Chan? You know, we keep hearing both. This is only part five. I mean, this might be a 25 part series, man. It might be 13 people. It might be 13,000 at the end of this day. We don't know who's going to serve this wave, man. But who is Preston John? Who is Preston John? All right, so let's go. I mean, I'll leave this link because this is, this is great. There's a lot of stuff to go uh, to dig on. I don't have time to get the door. So I just wanted to pull out a few of the babies. This is the last part I'll get. And then we're going to get back into... Uh, Lost tribes and promised lands. Much love again to our sister, uh, Darling Ray. Much love to Uno for all the drop. Let us find the truth. Always has the drop. Stay in that library and choose up. And you and ye shall understand that in all his country, nor in the countries there are about, men eat not but once in the day as they do in the court of the great Chad. Huh. And so they eat every day in his court, more than 30,000 persons without goers and comers, but the 30,000 persons in his country, one of the country, or something of the country of the great Chan, spend not so much good as do 12,000 in our country. All right, so we just keep talking about this correlation between Chan and Prestige. All right, all right. All right, so y'all look that up, man. It's good stuff, man. Good stuff. Good stuff. Now, again, this goes, you know, this particular link, again, goes into you know, the war between, I guess you would say, Genghis Khan and Preston Jack. 
Chicago on Kong, that's Prester John, was in fact a Nestorian Christian. Nestorian Christian. Old king renowned for wise counsel. Nestorian Christian. Fathers and uh, notwithstanding. Zingus, Genghis, Genghis fell out with him soon after the Tartar campaign. So after this campaign of the Tartars led by the Tartarian king, could it be an Israelite king? Campaign after Tigro or Prester John rejected a proposal to wed his son and daughter to Genghis's children. That's when all the beef really jumped off. See, before that, I mean, you know what I'm saying? We just read earlier that they married back and forth with their children. But now there seemed to be a rejection of proposal. Could this be the real story? A proposal to wed his son and daughter to Genghis's, Genghis's children, Cham's children. The rift between them grew until war broke out in 1203. How does that correlate with this Assyrian, Abyssinian invasion takeover over here? Did Genghis come over here to go to war with this Tartarian king, Preston John? What was the result of that? Is that when the Mongol hijack really started taking over in the 1200s? Is that... You know what I'm saying? Where we get this proxy, you know, calling themselves today Native Americans based on this Cham situation in 1203 coming over here based on <laughs> Preston John not wanting to wed his son and daughter to Chingas' children. That rift between them grew until war broke out in 1203 when Temujin, Temujin, who's Cham, so Temujin is Cham and Tagro is Preston John. So Temujin, growing power, plotted with Jamuka to have Temujin assassinated. Okay, let me go back. Let me go back. When Temujin attacked Jamuka for the title of Khan. Alright. So after Tagro rejected the proposal, the rift between them grew into 1203. War broke out. Then Tamujin Cham attacked Jamuka for the title of Khan. Tagro, where fearing Tamujin's growing power, plotted with Jamuka to have Tamujin assassinated, so he tried to assassinate Cham. Tagro Khan, Prester John, was killed in 1203 by Naaman soldiers. Who failed to recognize him as the former were fleeing from a defeat by Genghis Khan. So they're saying that Preston John was killed by Naaman soldiers who failed to recognize him as they were fleeing from getting their ass kicked by Chad. And they killed him on accident? Do you buy that? Chingis captured Zor Sarga Quantani Becky, the daughter of Tagro's brother, the daughter of Prester John's brother, Jake Gambu, and married her. So he took Prester John's niece and married her to his son, Talui. They had several children, including all these peoples, all destined to be great cons in their own right. Now they were married into the royal blood of Prester John. Why was it so important for Cham that he had to go to war with, with Prester John, Talgro, to marry into royal blood? So would he do all that for this Christian king, Nestorian Christian king, or would he do all that for a bloodline? He wanted to marry into a bloodline. So whether or not Preston John was hijacked into this Christian, you know, doctrine situation, 
What bloodline was he? Let me try to get to the bottom of things. All right. Let's get this part. According to Marco Polo's travels, the war between Prester John and Genghis Khan started when Genghis, new ruler of the rebellious Tartars. So he was new ruler of the Tartars. So he took over rulership from his foster pops, Prester John. Asked for the hand of Prester John's daughter in marriage. Ah, so it's getting even more specific. He wanted his daughter in marriage, specifically. Cham wanted John's daughter. Cham wanted priest king's daughter. Angered that his lowly vessel would presume to make such a request. So according to priest John, Cham was a lowly vessel based on his bloodline. His mongrel Mongolian bloodline. He's the foster son. He's not his legitimate heir. He just took him in. But he said, how dare you, man? You're a lowly vessel. Based on your bloodline. He said man. You know he's angered. That he would even presume to make such a request. And Preston John denied him. In those such uncertain terms. Drawn to the quick. Chingus Cham. Challenged Preston John. And in the war that followed. Preston John perished. You know so look. Chingus and Hong Kong for a manuscript. You don't think this is whitewashed. This is Chang'e and Ong Kong. So now this is Ong Kang Khan. This is what they want you to believe. That this is what they look like. None of these people look like this. Not when you understand. That Preston John. Look like this. So how do you go from this. To this. Huh? How do you go to that. So, you know, there's much more babies in this bath water. Again. Tagru Khan. Let's get it back. In this, he was aided by his father's blood brother, or Anda. Anda is his what, father's blood brother, his uncle. Tagru Khan, Prester John. Of the Kyrid, Borti had brought with her a wedding gift, a sable coat for Temujin's family. That's Cham. But he devised a better use for it. He presented it to Tagrokan, Praise John. In accepting the coat, Tagrokan agreed to treat Temujin as his own son and protect him as such. That's when he took in Cham. Whoa. Buddy, let's get it back. <laughs> let's get it back. Oh man, we gotta take it back right here. Let's just keep it right here. I know, I know it's kind of small to read, but it's too much drop to pass up. Let me get this right quick. Ah, oh, it's too good to be. It's just too good. Let's get it. In the 12th century, the Mongols, then living in the valley of Anan, all right, the Mongols. I was thinking about these champs. I was thinking about these Indo Aryans. Were very much a junior tribe amongst the nations of the Eastern Steppe. Their overlords were the Naaman of the northern slopes of Altai. So the Naamans were the overlords of the Mongols. So the Mongols were being ruled by the Naaman, who may have been a Turkish tribe, Turk tribe. Though the name Naaman is Mongolian, so they may be Turks. So they were being ruled by these Naaman Turks. The major competitors of the Naamans were the Karyid, Karyate of the Orgon and Tula, Tul valleys. Whose rank and file were probably, probably Mongol, but whose rulers were possibly Turkic. And along with the Mongols, the underdog positions were occupied by the Merkids, a forest people south of Bakal. 
and the Tartars, Merkid allies of the Biur-Nor region. So these Tartars were allies to the Merkids. All right, let's not get lost in the sauce. Now check it. The genetic tribes between the tribes were blurred, and so far their alliances, Yasugui, Yasugi, Tamujan's father. All right. So Tamujan is Genghis Khan, Genghis Chan. This is his pops. Yasegui, Yasegui. Cham's father, Tamujan's father, stole his bride from the Merkid. So he stole his woman. It's always about a woman. It's always got something to do with a woman. Always got something to do with a woman. Every time. No, okay. Let's go. So he stole his bride from the Merkid. A favor they returned by stealing Temujin's wife, Borte. So he got his wife stolen. They got their wife stolen. <laughs> All right. Yesugi of the Bor Jidids, Bor Jidids, Mongol clan met his end poisoned by the Tartars. After his death, the Mongols under the rival Talji Gud clan left Tamujin's family to fend for themselves. Ah, so Genghis Khan, his Cham, his Mongolian. His clan was deserted by the other Mongols, which is why he ended up raising up and whooping everybody's ass. This was what his beef was with everybody. He was abandoned by his own folks. So these Mongols left Cham's family to fend for themselves only after years of hardship was Cham or Temujin able to reconstitute his father's following. After years of hardship, he was able to get some of his father's following back. In this, he was aided by his father's blood brother, his father's blood brother, Andy, Anda, his father's blood brother, Anda, Tagu Khan of the Kiri. Mm-hmm. So his father's blood brother, Anda, Tagu Khan. Of the Kiri. So if Tagro Khan is pressed to Cha, then this is saying that Presta uh huh, that Presta Cha. Oh man, alright, let's just let's just surf the way. The Presta Cha is the blood brother of Cham's father. Not just his father. And then he took him in as his son, his foster son, but he's really his uncle. Let's keep going. <laughs> Tagro Khan of the Kiri. Borte had brought with her a wedding gift, a sable coat for Temujan's family, but he did devise a better use for it. He presented it to Tagro Khan and accepting the coat as a gift. Tagro Khan. Prester John agreed to treat Tam Eugene as his own son and protect him as such. So he took in his blood brother's kid. Okay. All right. Starting to make a little more sense now. This was a time when the Chinese Chen Dynasty was particularly annoyed with the Tartars. Kiri and Mongol joined the Chen in defeating the Tartars. In defeating the Tartars. 1202. In gratitude, Tagro Khan was given the Chinese title Wang Prince, which was soon corrupted in Mongol speech to Ong. Wang, Wang, Ong, Wang. So it is, it's Wang, but in Mongol speech they called it Ong Khan. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Kyrid and Mongol joined the Chen to de in defeating the Tartars. That's when the Tartars fell. So they joined the Chen dynasty. Even if they were not on the side originally of the Chen dynasty. These Mongols here, these Chinese Chen, 1202, defeating these Tartars. 
Now you just read about how this 1202 situation. 1203, Tabu Khan preached John was killed in 1203 by naming soldiers who voted to recognize him as the former were fleeing from the defeat of Genghis, Genghis Khan. Okay. According to Marco Polo's travel, the war between President John and Genghis Khan started when Genghis, Genghis, new ruler of the rebellious Tartars, asked for the hand of Prester John's daughter in marriage. Angered that his lowly vassal would presume to make such a request, Prester John denied him in no uncertain terms, drawn to the quick. He got pissed. Genghis challenged his uncle, Prester John, and in the war that followed, Prester John perished. Wow. So if Prester John preached John is the blood uncle of Genghis Khan Chan. What does that got to do with you? And is Prester John a hijack? Or has he been hijacked? We might not figure this out to part eighteen. But we are going to surf the wave, man, and, and get with it. So we're about ready to, uh, man, that was a good intro. Oh, I didn't even get to this yet. I didn't even get to this yet. I didn't even get to this yet. <laughs> I was thinking about saving this for y'all, but let's just get it right quick. All right, this is out of a book called The Way, The Prophetic Messianic Voice to the Path of Edenic Kingdom uh, by Shalomin, Shalomin, Halawahi, I believe you say it. But, you know, dig on it, dig on it, dig on it. This is also something uh, out of a package of drop that Darlene Ray just dropped on me, man. So, again, love to the sister Darlene. I'm not even going to go too far into it right now, but... You know, we're going to get into Abraham, ancient Israelites. You know what I mean? We're going to get into the Hindu connection, what we're talking about. The natives of Kashmir, as well as those of Afghanistan, pretending to be descended from the Jews, give pedigrees of their kings reigning in their present country up to the sun and the moon. And along with this, they show you the temple still standing built by Solomon, statues of Noah, and other Jewish patriarchs, Hebrew patriarchs, the traditions of the Afghans, indigenous Afghans, <laughs> tell them that they are descended from the tribe of EUD, Yuda, IUD. And in this they are right, for it is the tribe of Juid. Noticed by Eusebius to have, remember Eusebius with the Mazaka drop. Noticed by Eusebius to have existed before the son of Jacob in western Syria was born. The Jewed, Ued, Yaudi of Hodu, Yuda. And from which tribe the western Jews with the Brahmin, Abraham, descended and migrated. Told you I'm not gonna I'm just this is a teaser for what might be coming up, you know. A little soon. <laughs> but you know, we're gonna surf the wave and see how they're trying to connect the Brahmin with Abraham with this you know situation. I don't know, but we're gonna go. But this is very interesting. It says the tribe of Krishna <laughs> had a name. Which was very remarkable, Captain Wilford says. The Yadas, Yadas, his own tribe and nation, were doomed to destruction for their sins. So this Lord Krishna Shiva situation, the Yadas, that's their tribe, were doomed to destruction for their sins. And then look at this comparison. Like, just like the descendants of Yahuda, Yuda, which is the true pronouncing, 
pronunciation of Judah. So they're trying to compare this tribe of Krishna with this Yada and this Yuda. But they don't say Yada is Yuda. They just say that they were doomed to destruction for their sins, just like the tribe of Judah was. But here's where it gets mighty nice and interesting. Mr. Maureen says the Yadavas, Yadavas, were the most uh, venerable immigrants from India. So the Yadaras were the most venerable immigrants from India. They were the blameless and pious Ethiopians. Whoa, you didn't see that coming. Hmm. The mixed multitude, the Abyssinians, Indians, Indo Aryan, Atlantean, Egyptian. Let's keep going. With the blameless and pious Ethiopian, the Yadaras, the Yadarvas, Yadavas, the Yadavas. Yadavas were the most venerable immigrants from India. They were the blameless and pious Ethiopians who Homer mentions and calls the remotest of mankind. Part of them, say the old Hindu writers, remained in this country and hence we read of two Ethiopian nations. The Western and the Oriental body bag for the illusion. Ah, so if we're reading about the Western Ethiopia and the Oriental, the Asiatic, the Asian, the East uh, Ethiopia, the Western Abyssinia, the Eastern Abyssinia. Now is this play play? When you have Kush, K-U-S-H, Kush, in the capital city, Mero, of the Nile. Of Ethiopia, Mero, Kush. Why is all this here? Punt, Zimbabwe, Timbuktu, Darfur, Iranistan, Amazon, Stagia, Kim, Luxor, do you get it? And was this here before it was here? That scholars have broken down clear, and we have broken it down clear. How after this land is separated, after these multiple floods and deluges have happened, not all land popped up at the same exact time. And much was happening here. Before it started getting down here again. Alright. So just wanted to get that. Again. The Yadavas. Alright. This tribe of Krishna. These Hindu, these Indians, these Indo Aryans, these Yadavas were the most venerable immigrants from India. They were the blameless and pious Ethiopians, whom Homer mentions and calls the remotest of mankind. Part of them say the old Hindu writers remained in this country, and hence we read of two Ethiopian nations, the Western and the Oriental. Some of them lived far to the east. And they are the Yadaras who stayed in India, while others resided far to the west. The fact of art of the tribe yet remaining in existence is one of the pieces of circumstantial evidence which I consider invaluable. It cannot be the produce of forgery. It cannot be the produce of forgery in the couples. And couples very well with the two Zions. How much have you looked into there being two Zion? One over there, one over here. Two Merus, Meru, Mount Meru. 
Mount Meru. There's a Mount Meru, um, I believe around somewhere in Tanzania. Over there, you know what I'm saying? I mean, there's multiple Meru's, multiple Zions. What's the original? It is on circumstance, circumstances of this kind that I ground my system. They surpass all written evidence, for they cannot have been forged. This immigrating tribe of Yada or Yuda, we shall find of the first importance, for they are no other than the Jews. And we'll look into this to Ethiopia, to Zion situation. We're only talking about Priest John. We're only talking about Priest John. Hey, man, you might feel like I knew I kind of had a grip on this guy. And now, hey, it's okay, man. When it comes to this investigation and any investigation, you have to lay all the evidence out. Don't make your mind up too fast. That will confuse you. Relax. Right here, they're calling him the Emperor de los Abyssinios, Abyssinia, Ethiopia. We're reading here that he's a blood relative to Cham. He's an uncle. Is he a Mongol? Is Cham a Mongol like that? You know what I'm saying? What are these people for real? Were they hijacking you? Were they hijacked? Was Preston John hijacked? Was he for you or against you, man? Was he for you or against you? All right? And, uh, you know, man, this is some great job, too, man. The sister gave me a, a drop package. I'll just get this one, you know, a couple sentences, man. Just right quick. All the stuff about Preston John. Preston John. It must be said at once that we shall never know whether the queen who visited Solomon was a pure-blooded Abyssinian. Queen Sheba, was she a pure-blooded Abyssinian? Ethiopian, mixed breed, mixed multitude. I mean, how can you be a pure-blooded mix? So that kind of leads you to thinking that, you know, there's one definition of Abyssinian as a mixed multitude. There's... There's another bloodline we're talking about. Or an Arab queen from Yaman or Hadramat or some other part of the Great Arabian Peninsula. But the traditions of some queen of the south did visit Solomon. It's so old and widespread that a kernel of historic fact, however small, must be hidden somewhere in it. So in other words, it's saying it must be some babies in the bathwater. Now check it. It would not surprise me if Sidney Smith or C.J. Gadd once one day published in the great corpus of cuneiform text from the tablets in the British Museum a Sumerian or Babylonian inscription telling how some great queen from latter day India paid a visit to a king of one of the city states like Itana or Mesopotamia, Mesa. Mesa Nepada, or the great Sargon, or Agade, Agade, to be instructed in the wisdom and civilization of his day. Queen from India. So this queen of Sheba, was she a pure-blooded Abyssinia, and uh, what does that mean? Does that mean that she has a connection to the Hindu or these Indo-Aryans or this latter-day India. What does it mean, I say? What does it mean? What are we saying? So you know I want to get on this, but I'll say this, you know, maybe for part six. Um, I want to get more on this drop about the Sabatnyan River, but... We'll come back to this maybe in part six. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you know, there's another, uh, you know what I'm saying? We got the last of this, but as we keep going, as we keep on going, watch this. Y'all thought we was done with Preston John. Now, remember, let's just scroll right quick before we take it. Nice relaxing pause and just check out a couple short little vids, a couple short drops, and we'll 
do I dismount again to Lost Tribes? Let's get to the table of contents right quick. If they have it, they might not have it up. Oh, there we go. So we got Prester John or the Noble Ethiopian. Got a little bit of Columbus's Golden World. Alright. Now when we get chapter 10, the end of Presser John, and that's page 112. So I'm gonna stop at 92 and go to 112 right quick. Okay, well, it got us right there to the end of Preston John. So, you know, we'll start there instead. You know, I just like to surf the wave. If we got there first, we'll do it. But before we get in that, man, let's just, uh, you know, I know we went right into it. I didn't mean to tell you the truth. I kind of wanted to fall back a little bit and, you know, surf some of this. But definitely, man, support Jay Stu, man. Keep on digging. Love to the brother, man. Just love to all the family making plans man i mean that's really what takes precedence over all of this drop the manifestation of everything we're kicking is jace too and his family all the brothers and sisters that's building around them they set this thing up into a whole nother level they have forced us in a sense to awaken parts of us that were asleep and make plans that are for the awakening so love to jace too love to camellia love to the brothers love to the sisters everybody Involved in the journey, man. And we're going to keep building and keep doing it the right way. Let's take a quick pause, man. And just... <laughs> Lord of the Universe kicking some 420 drop, man. Go ahead, man. Do you, man. Do your thing, man. Space is water. Space is water. That's all I got to say, man. Space is water. Surf the way. Let's go. It's a process called sonoluminescence. The first time I saw sonoluminescence was in a darkened room. I was transfixed to look at this uh, spherical flask of fluid. And you'd look into the center and in the center, see a, uh, a glowing blue-purple light, uh, which could be seen with the unaided eye. It looked like a star in the heavens. Seth Putterman called it the star in a jar, a tiny spot of bright light contained in a flask of liquid. This star in a jar is made when a sound wave is passed through a small bubble inside a flask of liquid. And this sound wave makes the bubble do something remarkable. First it expands, then it collapses. And this collapse happens so violently that vapor molecules trapped inside the bubble slam together and heat up so much that the bubble gives off an incredible burst of heat and light, several thousand times a second, giving the appearance of a star. What made the phenomenon so exciting was the temperature of this star in a jar. On its surface alone, the light burns at tens of thousands of degrees. And Seth Putterman now contemplated a tantalizing possibility. Could the core of the collapsing bubble be even hotter? Hot enough for fusion. One of the 
mysteries of sonal luminescence is to determine exactly how hot the interior of the bubble gets. In the sun, the interior can be millions of degrees, hot enough to uh, cause fusion. And the thought crossed my mind that perhaps inside the collapsing bubble, the interior of the bubble might also get hot enough to cause fusion. If so, this would be something truly amazing. By simply bombarding tiny bubbles with sound waves, temperatures of over 10 million degrees would be created. A nuclear fusion, the same reaction that powers the sun, would be happening almost effortlessly here on Earth. Surf the wave, surf the wave, water's above, water's below, water's above, water's below, let's get a little legal drop, why not man, let's get a little legal drop, sometimes you gotta know a couple things man. You gotta know about these two constitutions, you gotta know about the hijack. When you talk about freedom, don't point to that beloved parchment, the Constitution, as a symbol of your enduring freedom. It is a representative of a form of government which seemingly no longer exists in this country today. The Constitution has been thrown out the window. The Republic shoved aside and replaced with a democracy. The thing is, most people in this country remain unaware that this is so because they simply do not know the truth, what lies beyond the myths. Your so-called government is not going to tell you either. To even begin to understand what has happened to the Republic, we must look backward in time to a period following the Civil War. We must go back to the year 1871, which was the beginning of the decline of the Republic. When we examine what happened during that time in our history, we begin to piece together this troubling, perplexing puzzle that is America. Only then should we answer as to whether we are indeed a free people or not. The date is February 21st, 1871, and the 41st Congress is in session. I refer you to the Acts of the 41st Congress, Section 34, Session 3. The first colored senators and representatives. Who are they? Are they you? Let's go. Chapter 61 and 62. On this date in the history of our nation, Congress passed an act titled An Act to Provide a Government for the District of Columbia. This is also known as the Act of 1871. What does this mean? Well, it means that Congress, under no constitutional authority to do so, created a separate form of government for the District of Columbia, which is a 10 square mile parcel of land. The Act of 1871 was passed at a vulnerable time in America. Our nation was essentially bankrupt, weakened, and financially depleted in the aftermath of the Civil War. The Civil War itself was nothing more than a calculated front for some petty fancy footwork by corporate backroom players. It was a strategic maneuver by European interests, the international bankers, who were intent upon gaining a stronghold on the neck and the coffers of America. The Congress realized our country was in dire financial straits, so they cut a deal with the international bankers. In those days, the Rothschilds of London were dipping their fingers into everyone's pie, thereby incurring a debt to said bankers. If you think about banks, we know they do not just lend us money out of the goodness of their hearts. A bank will not do anything for you unless it is entirely in their best interest to do so. There has to be some sort of collateral or some string attached which puts you and me into a subservient position. This was true back in 1871. The conniving international bankers were not about to lend our floundering nation any money without some serious stipulations. So they devised a brilliant way of getting their foot in the door of the United States, a prize they had coveted for some time, but had been unable to grasp thanks to our founding fathers who despised them and held them in check. And thus, the act of 1871 was passed. In essence, this act formed the corporation known as the United States. Note the capitalization because it is important. This corporation owned by foreign interests moved right in and shoved the original organic version of the Constitution into a dusty corner. With the Act of 1871, our Constitution was defaced in the sense that the title was block capitalized 
and the word for was changed to the word of in the title. The original Constitution drafted by the Founding Fathers was written in this manner. The Constitution for the United States of America. The altered version reads, the Constitution of the United States of America. It is a corporate constitution. It is not the same document you might think it is. The corporate constitution operates in an economic capacity and has been used to fool the people into thinking it is the same parchment that governs the Republic. It absolutely is not. Capitalization and the insignificant change? Not when one is referring to the context of a legal document, it isn't. Such minor alterations have had major impacts on each subsequent generation born in this country. What the Congress did with the passage of the Act of 1871 was create an entirely new document, a constitution for the government of the District of Columbia. The kind of government they created was a corporation. The new altered constitution serves as a constitution of the corporation and not that of America. Think about that for a moment. Incidentally, this corporate constitution does not benefit the Republic. It serves only to benefit the corporation. It does nothing good for you or me, and it operates outside of the original constitution. Instead of absolute rights guaranteed under the organic constitution, we now have relative rights or privileges. One example of this is the sovereign's right to travel, which has been transformed under corporate government policy into a privilege which we must be licensed to engage in. This operates outside of the original Constitution. So, Congress committed treason against the people who were considered sovereign under the Declaration of Independence and the organic Constitution. Any questions? You know the difference between of the people and for the people. For the people means they're working, you know, of course, this is all hijacking us, but for those that are, you know, really into this Constitution stuff, for means they're working for you. So when they set up their declaration and all this kind of stuff, then they were they were working for the hijacks that were covered under that. Of course, slaves weren't covered under any of this stuff, and slaves were none other than the people that were already here, the people of the covenant that were already here. The people of Adam that were already here. We don't need your constitution. We don't need your prostitution. We were already here. You don't steal something and move on with life. At some point there is retribution and recompense. You knew that. You did it anyway. And a bunch of people live and go about their merry life with no thought of recompensing retribution for the souls of the Most High's children slaughtered for your, con <laughs> your constitution of your corporation, of the people. Now of is of them. It's the constitution of us. Before it was for you, then it's well, not you, but, you know, for the hijacks that came over here in that illusion. Now it's of the con the corporation, and they don't even care about the hijacks or the descendants. They only care about the privateers, the owners, the bloodlines that have the ownership that are the of, not the for. So everybody was hijacked at the end of the day. At the end of the day, everybody wants order, not chaos in the street. The Most High only promises that when his people are returned to order. From the bottom to the top. It's the covenant. It's the indigenous. It's in our genes to remember. It's in our energy, our frequency, our vibration, our connection with our sacred trees, our earth, our balance, our framer, our shaper. We the people, we the people. So y'all can check the rest of that out as we get prepared for our dismount. I did want to get, you know what I'm saying, a little love to my man Francisco. Always keeping it trail, man. 
dropping that drive. Let's go. During a meeting at the Georgian Patriarchate, Patriarch Ilya II expressed hope it would further strengthen bilateral relations. From a Hebrew scroll burned beyond recognition, researchers have resurrected one of the earliest known versions of the Old Testament. They used a new digital reconstruction technique that they believe may be invaluable in revealing words from other previously unreadable finds. In research published in Science Advances, computer analysts at the University of Kentucky in Lexington virtually unwrapped a roll of parchment that had been reduced to a lump of charcoal in a burning synagogue 1,500 years ago without ever actually touching the artifact. First, we capture the 3D shape of the layers of the scroll in a process called segmentation. On the left side of the screen, the software moves through the scroll, image by image, tracing the shape of a single scroll wrap. On the right, we see the 3D model that this produces. Next, we extract the ink from the data in a process called texturing, revealing the text on the scroll. However, because the surface is curved, it's difficult to read all of the text from one viewpoint. The flattening stage of our pipeline converts this textured 3D surface into a flat plane so that the text can be more easily read. To produce the best results, these three steps must be performed on one small section of the scroll at a time. Each section is then merged together, producing a single consolidated image that shows the full text that turned out to be verses from the book of Leviticus. Religious scholars in Israel who analyzed the text said it's the earliest known copy of a central book of the Torah exhumed from a holy ark, one that's identical to the text printed in most versions of the Hebrew Bible today. The scientists plan to make this digital reconstruction technique freely available, which may prove useful for forensic experts and intelligence agencies looking to recover words from texts damaged by fire or shredding. deal with it you know what i'm saying that's all i gotta say about that francisco love to you bro who got the drop who got the drop who got the drop francisco dropping that drop man love to you love to everybody all right man um oh yeah right quick man let's not forget let's not forget you know i'm just going i heard flat plane and i just remember man planet the etymology of planet. We got this last time again. Wandering star. To wonder. Possibly P I E Pele. Flat. It's to spread. Spread out. Planet. Flat. Planet. Flat. Planet. Flat. Plane. Would make it a relative of plane. There is no spherical planet, it's just isolated. There is no isolated. There are no spherical isolated situations. It is flat plane, wherever you're looking. Only globular through the tricking of the telescope and in the illusion of isolated global bodies. But planet is plane. To make devious. So who lives on these planes? What do we see in the Vedic cosmology was living on these planes? All these demigods to make devious, repel, dissuade from the right path, bewilder. Planet, plane, in correlation to devious and repelling and dissuading you from the right path, bewildering you? Huh? Let's go. Plano, alternative form of plan E, flat, level, flat, level, but also used in sciences as a comb form of Greek planos, wandering sea planet, sea planet, plain, plain, flat, spread, spread out, devious, repelled, dissuading for the right path, dissuade from the right path, Plano, plani, flat, level. Any questions? You are firm, fixed, and immovable. You are flat and level, and your planets are planes, and they are flat and level. 
and on those flat level celestial connected areas are wandering, devious, repelling entities, energies, Saturn, Jupiter, dissuading you from the right path. They live in the first heaven, the celestial, underneath the firmament, bewildering you. Thoth, Amon, spell barrier. Any questions? Let's go. And don't forget, got a little bit of this, but there's a little section I wanted to make sure I got to you guys. Remember, the Yadavas were the most venerable immigrants from India. They were the blameless and pious Ethiopians, these Indo-Aryans, this tribe of Krishna, Ethiopian, tribe of Krishna, Ethiopian, tribe of Krishna, pious Ethiopian. Now, hence we read of two Ethiopian nations, the Western and the Oriental or Eastern. Two, two Zions. We're going to get more into this, man. You already see it coming. See how much I'm digging on it already. From the accounts given by Dr. Buchanan of the black tribes, some of them behaving or having pentatox and other not having them. Man, so these are the accounts given by Dr. Buchanan of the black tribes of India. Let's go. <laughs> uh, and of those having around them, ordained them from. And of those who have them, having ordained them from the white tribes. So these Pentateuch, Pentateuch, what's that? Is that the, uh, is that the star? Trying to go on tour. There we go, there we go, there we go. Well. Oh, okay, so we're just talking about the specific uh, Torah or the this particular Greek uh, Hellenistic version of the Torah. So we're not talking about the Hebrew Torah. We're talking about the Hellenistic version. So we're just saying that some of them having the Pentateuch, the Hellenistic version, and others not having them. And those who had them had ordained them from white tribes. So you see how this Greek version was getting hijacked in, from, hi, from hijacks, from converts, from Jewish converts, giving them this stuff. It seemed probable that they are indebted for them solely to the white tribes. So now they have to be indebted to the white tribes from getting that Greek hijack drop that they are getting. This will exactly agree as my expected, as my theory, if it shall turn out to be true, because the Apogosh, Apogosh or going out of the tribe of Judy or Eudi or from India, in all probability, must have taken place before Moses lived and before he partly wrote and partly compiled or collected the tracks into what we now call the Pentateuch. In all probability, the first books of Genesis were brought from India with the tribe, with Abraham, or with the Brahmin. I'm going to let y'all dig on that. This is some real different drop. But when you're rock, rocking in truth, you're rocking in foundation, you're surfing away, you ain't got to be, you know, disheveled about nothing. Just look at, look into it, look it up, and see how it fits into the energy, frequency, vibration that you're flowing with. None of us know shit. So because I don't know shit, I'm just going to lay it on the table like I always did to Drop Nation. 
I said, I don't have the answers, but we do have the answers. All right, so were the first books of Genesis brought from India with the tribes with Abraham or Brahmins? Is this Abraham Brahmin? Or is that a hijack? Uh, Eusebius in his Chronicon says the Ethiopians coming from the Indus or Black River settles near Egypt. There seems to be nothing improbable in these Ethiopians being the tribe of the Jews, the tribe of Jacob or Israel. I think these Ethiopians did come under Jacob and did settle in Goshen and gave the names of Materia and Avarice to the city in which they dwell, Avari in Hebrew would be as often written, whatever that is, Obri, Abri, or the city of the Hebrews, or foreigners. Uh-huh. Hey, Amen. Y'all gonna get me started on this, because I didn't even want to get into it yet. Later on, the Yadas overthrew many Peru rulers, Peru, Peru rulers. We're just talking about some other guy in Hindu mythology named Peru. Does that got any collection correlation with this city, Peru? What are we talking about? How is this connecting to the Shiva? What are they trying to do? All right, so we're going to get into a little bit of that. But there was another Cham situation that popped up that I wanted to get to, but. I might have to catch that one next time. Man. Man, man, man. If you like drop, this would be it. If you like drop, you will find lots of babies. Just scrolling around like this through some of these documents, man. So, uh huh. Mm -hmm. It is also believed that Isaac and Jacob and Israel are mentioned in the Ebla, Ebla text. And remember, Damascus was at and is still part of Syria. It is plain and clear that Abram. Had a great influence as king, priest, figure. Another priest king. See, I'm trying to get away from Preston John, but here's this other priest king figure. And was known throughout India, Sumeria, Syria, Canaan, and Egypt. And pretty much all of Asia, Mesopotamia. And then they started getting into the evidence and different things. Man, oh man, all right. Jam to the jam to jam to jam jam. Man, how Abram fought with the Assyrians and overcame them and saved the Sodomite prisoners and took from the Assyrians the prey they had gotten. Should I say that again? I told y'all some drop was on the way. I'm just giving y'all a little preview into it. You can pause it. You can get ahead of me. But you got this Abraham Assyrian situation. How is this stuff really lining up to us? I gotta find that Cham again. Because he chammed me earlier. I saw Cham just come out of nowhere. Cham. Oh, Cham. Gotta be careful with this cham, man. Cham just pops up, so y'all see already what I'm getting at. Y'all see already what's coming. And I mean, this is just from looking up Preston John and just a beautiful work. Drop Nation's doing behind the scenes. Like Uno said, man, we got the dopest research team because we're all unafraid of being wrong or we have to be right, you know, about this and that. It's just, it's real dope to come through this stuff because we know we're getting a lot of babies out. And the things that stay, the things that connect, or the things that, you know, we continue to rock with and make sense out of. So, you know, we could be a little fast and loose, man. You know what I'm saying? We can have some kind of, some type of confidence in how we do these things, man. 
Okay, all right. So let's make our dismount. And we will be getting back into this Atlanta Preston John, sitting by my man Uno, getting to the root. We got a little bit of this last time. But it ain't gonna suck me in a day. Oh man, you already know I love this one too. Benjamin and Tadula. That's a great bit of research right there. All this will be going up in the library this week. I just gotta sit down and do it. So we're gonna make our dismount the end of Preston John. Out of Lost Tries and Promised Lands by Ronald Sanders. You already know. Let's go. Right. Time without limit, wrote Abraham Zacuto, would not suffice to relate the happenings in Portugal until which over 120,000 Jews entered from Spain, and only a small remnant survived the ravages of the plague. Of these, were taken cap of these some were taken captive, their children seized and carried off to distant lands. Others, overwhelmed by suffering, changed their religion. The long Portuguese tradition of tolerance towards Jews had come to an end before 1492. In 1481, the Cortes of Evora had given King John II official notice of a groundswell of popular anti-Semitism. Everybody's calling you anti-Semitic, but you have to be an Israelite. You have to be a Shemite to really have that complaint. So these popular anti-Semitism that he could no longer ignore. Members' complaints about Jews ranged from ostentation and dress to tax farming and to Jewish artisans, tailors, shoemakers, and the like, who they said entered royal, rural Christian homes under the pretext of doing their work, but then tried to seduce the women while the men were out in the field. So don't that sound like they do with Negroes? Don't that sound like the same story? Oh. White women cry this and this, and you got situations like Emmett Till. Some some girl said he was flirting, or, or he, he looked at a white girl, so he got dragged in the back of a truck, this stuff, this lynching and all that stuff. So all they had to do was say, oh, okay, yeah, they're trying to seduce the women while the men were out in the field. The king agreed to legislation curbing Jewish uh, sub subtuary habits and reviving the ancient and hitherto long-forgotten requirements that Jews wear an identifying badge on their clothing. Okay. The arrival of a huge Jewish refugee population in 1492 was therefore more than the king could put up with, although he could not resist the opportunity to fill his coffers by charging the new arrivals a large entrance large entrance fee but he would not allow them to stay and made March 31st 1493 the deadline for their departure so he said you niggas gotta get out of here when the time came many of the Jewish refugees pushed out into North Africa and elsewhere but others stayed to put this unwanted Portuguese severity to the test. The threatened penalty was enslavement to the Portuguese crown, an ambiguous status that may have seemed to promise advantages or promise advantages in the eyes of some Jews. But the king dashed any such sanguine or sanguine expectations, commanding according to the royal chronicler Rue de Pina, that all who were minors, youth and girls alike were to be taken captives from among those Castilian Jews in his kingdom who did not betake themselves away within the appointed time according to the conditions of their entrance. All these children were forcibly converted to Christianity. So these Hebrews were converted to Christianity and sent to the island of Seotonum, St. Thomas, in the Gulf of Guiana, which had been discovered by Portuguese ships. So how did these people get over there into Guiana? Let's go which had been discovered by Portuguese ships a little over 20 years earlier. And so much being separated, they would reasonably be better Christians and it would be a result 
of this that the island came to be more densely populated on account of this this it began to thrive exceedingly indeed it was to thrive so well that by the middle of the next century it would be the most intrepid most important entry entry pot between the african mainland and the new world for the transatlantic slave trade in other words that's where they would stop before shipping you away from the new world not bringing you just to the new world because you were already here so then they use that as a entry pot as a place between this is not the only instance of the persecuted being turned into persecutors during the course of the cruel age john the second died toward the end of 1495 in the accession ascension accession of his cousin Manuel the first seemed at first to promise a better fate for the jewish refugees who had remained in portugal he granted them free status shortly after his accession and no doubt it was hoped that he would soon bring the converted children back from their saint thomas exile but then the situation was completely changed once again the following year by his uh, betrothal to one of the daughters of ferdinand and isabella manuel attached great importance to this alliance hoping that a descendant of his might one day sit on the throne of spain as well as portugal and he therefore was willing to make significant concessions of his prospective ro royal in-laws in -laws. one of the demands was that their work of expulsion be completed in the entire arabian peninsula be made to use a most appropriate word from another time and culture judenrin judenrin Judenrin. <laughs> Manuel agreed not only to expel the refugees but to eliminate Judaism from Portugal altogether. Or niggas, right? The decree that he accordingly published in December 1496 commanded that all the Jews of his realm either convert to Christianity or go into exile. By the following March 31st, Manuel was still a true Portuguese, Portuguese king at heart. However, and was not so ready as the Spanish sovereigns had been to renounce an ec economically valuable segment of the population merely for the sake of principle. It caused Manuel great uneasiness, wrote a chronicler, to think of so many thousands of men leaving his kingdom and being driven into banishment, and he was desirous of at least converting their sons everybody wanted to convert you shut your eyes the cruel precedent of stealing away Jewish children had already been established by his cousin so they stole you to convert you right just like they're going to want to steal your children to vaccinate them and convert them to whatever new agenda they have so Manuel decided to try he ordered all the sons of the Jews under 14 years of age to be forcibly taken from their parents can you imagine that? Stick around in the cities. Can you imagine that? Forcibly taken from their parents. That they might be instructed and initiated in Christian faith. What kind of initiation is that? Steal the children and indoctrinate them. And beat them until they say, yeah, Jesus. Christian Jesus. Dumb diverses. 1452 Papal Bull. Click the link below. This could not be executed without seizing or causing the most affecting, the most affecting and heart heart rendering scenes, of course. Then in the last last moments before the deadline went into effect, Manuel turned away from such head on confrontations and resorted to quiet bargaining with Jewish community leaders. He agreed that in exchange for a token conversion on their part, he would allow them to go on practicing Judaism in private. He says, man, I don't even want all this drama with y'all. Nuggets. Just convert in private. I mean, do this in private. It would keep the Inquisition away from the doorsteps. The result was that for generations to come, Portugal was to be the homeland of a secret Judaism, or Hebrews, for rampart, more rampart than any, than any that Spain had ever known, but even this arrangement was, of course, unacceptable to Jews, uncompromising in their faith. Hebrews, that's just rocking with the created to the end, and they don't want to sacrifice nothing. 
and a significant portion of Portuguese jewelry went into exile on March 31st, 1497. This is all happening after your 1452 papal bull, Dumb Diverses, in that year. Abraham Zaccato asked, there was an expulsion of Jews from the kingdom of Navarre, so that no Jew as such was left in the whole Arabian Peninsula. Now, how does this have to relate to these niggas? These niggas. These niggas. The title of the ruler of Abyssinia, 1590s. The Amharic from Amharic Nagush King. From stem of Nagasha, he forced, ruled. The title of the ruler of Abyssinia, 1590s, from Amharic Nagush, king, from stem Nagasha, he forced, ruled. Nagash, how does that relate to Naga? <laughs> they got Nagasaki in Hindu mythology, Hindu mythology, Indo-Aryan, Atlantean mythology, race of serpent demons, offspring of Kodori, guardians of the under region, 1785 Sanskrit, Naga, serpent, snake, Naga, Naga, Hindu, race of serpent demons, Naga, Neges, title of ruler, stemming from Nagasha, forced rule. So somebody forced rulership. These serpent demon kings forced rulership. They are also known as the title of rulers of Abyssinia. And how does that relate to Prester John, Emperor de los Abyssinios? And here's his relationship to the Kong's Hong Kong. Genghis Khan, Cham, Indo-Aryan, Cham, India, Atlantis. All oh, this is coming together. I love y'all. This is part five. See y'all in part six. Press the John. We on you.